Welcome to the City Current Show. I'm your host, Andrew Bartolotta. We're always honored to bring you stories of individuals and organizations with inspiring stories, making an impact in our community. And when I tell you that this conversation will be one to remember, I'm serious. We have the pleasure of talking with Alice Marie Johnson, founder and chief executive officer of Taking Action for Good Foundation, an author and recently received an Ebony Power 100 Award. Alice, thanks for joining us today. Thank you, Andrew, for having me on today. It's an honor to be speaking with you and to this community. Before we discuss Taking Action for Good, for years you lived a normal life with no prior criminal record. You were a manager at FedEx, a wife and a loving mother of five. After an emotionally and financially tumultuous period in your life and with few options, you made a terrible mistake and became involved in a drug conspiracy as a telephone mule. Even though you played a minor role, you were convicted of attempted drug possession in 1996 and sentenced to a mandatory life plus 25 year sentence. Now, before I even ask questions, I feel like we need to sit in this. The gravity of what you call an unexecuted death sentence is unimaginable to so many. But for those who I hope will read your book, Afterlife, my uh, journey from an incarceration to freedom, can you give listeners a quick history of your time in prison and how you made the most of the 21 years, seven months, and what was it, six days behind bars, including mentoring women and even doing virtual Skype speeches at colleges and universities? Yes, my time behind bars was time that was truly uh, life-changing for me Um, in a very dark, in a very dark time, Andrew. I know that it's unimaginable, and never in my wildest dreams did I think that I would be one who would end up in a federal prison serving, as I said many times, an unexecuted sentence of death. The reason that I call it that is because in the federal system, life means life. I was given a life plus 25-year sentence without the possibility of parole because there is no parole in the federal system. So really, Andrew, I had a choice. I had a choice whether I was going to get busy with the business of looking at the days, as they say, they'd be carrying me out in a body bag or use time, which is a gift to impact the culture, prison culture, and to still live my life as full as I possibly could. When I went into prison, Andrew, my mother, my, I came from a family that, a very strong family of faith. Both my parents are Christians. I had, there were nine children. And we, I had a very strong foundation of faith. And I saw my parents overcome adversity. And I think that that paved the way for me to go into prison and not consider myself a victim in there, but to live life and see what I could do to be of service to others. Because looking around, I saw so many broken women, so much no hope, hopelessness in prison. And I didn't want my life just to be the sum of that. And I knew, you know, I I take ownership that I did something wrong, but I did not feel that a life sentence was warranted for a first time ever nonviolent offense. Going into prison, I, I made changes, not only changes in my life, but I helped others change their lives too. I, became, I always had this gift to write and I started writing plays and women who didn't think that they could do anything, all of a sudden they realized they could sing, they could dance, they could, they could, they used their gift of drawing to make beautiful creations of artwork. And so it really did change culture. Not only that, I helped those who were so, so much on the outside fringes. You know, it's one thing to be in prison in a dark place. It's another thing, Andrew, to be there and not have any hope, to be ones who were mentally challenged and physically challenged. So I saw these women who were in mental, there was a mental health part of the prison of, um, and they were in, they were locked in, they didn't participate. And there were women who had physical disabilities also. And these women could not participate in anything. So I helped coordinate the first ever Special Olympics for women who had physical and mental disabilities uh, challenges. And that changed so much their lives 
I also mentored so many women uh, through this, through just bring, getting them involved, not just in the theater and in art, but also in teaching classes, helping them to have confidence in themselves, because that was, that was so important to me. I had children. Some of those women there were as young as my children. They were younger than my children. And I always hoped that I would be able to, even when they rejoin their, their families, that they would rejoin them as totally changed women. You grew up in a strong Christian household and yes. faith is a huge part of your story. Talk about remaining that faith throughout the 21, almost 22 years uh, behind bars as well and how faith brought you uh, through the two decades. Andrew, I have some very hard days sometimes in prison, but my faith is truly what kept me going. I always believed that one day I would return home to my family. I had a lot of ups and downs. I fought for my freedom. I just had a lot of disappointment. But through all of it, I turned to my faith in God. I grew up in a very strong Christian family, and I saw my family. I saw my parents. I saw their faith when things were hard, how they clung to their faith. And sometimes our answers come in different ways that are so unexpected. But I knew that without my faith in God, I could not have made it. I could not have made it through those years. So that is really what kept me strong. It was not positive thinking. It was my faith that God saw me. He heard me. He knew where I was. When I first entered prison, a woman came up to me in a wheelchair, and she asked me my name, and I told her, she said, Alice, bloom where you're planted. God knows where you are. And that, that stuck with me. And when things got so hard for me, I remembered that, that God knew where I was, and I knew that there had to be some purpose, that there had to be something greater that would come out of this than what I could even see. I, uh, I'm i getting a little teary just thinking about your story and the the adversity. You, you had a lot of grief um, and a lot of challenges along the way that really led up to you um, making these decisions that ultimately led you uh, into prison um, for, for two decades. And then you, you have this opportunity to uh, mentor women behind bars and and be such a inspiring light for those who feel like they don't have they don't have meaning anymore and for for so many of those that are behind bars that don't think and for you you have this life sentence plus 25 you never even touched the the drugs which which learning more about your story it's so unfair the criminal justice system that, that puts you behind bars. And even those that you were, um, that you worked with um, along this, uh, this with the drugs, they, they got lighter sentences. I mean, when, they did. that's not that's even, the way that's the not system is set up. Yeah, that's the way the system is set up. Um, those who make plea deals, they testify, they're given lighter sentences. I never received a last share of any of the money that came through that um, illegal enterprise. I, the first time I received $1,000, as I said, that put food on my table and kept lights on. I'm not trying to minimize my role because anything that I did in commission of any crime is wrong. It is absolutely wrong. One thing, Andrew, that I didn't focus on, I didn't focus on anger, I didn't focus on unforgiveness. It's the laws that needed to change. The laws that are in place, the mandatory minimum sentencing, that put a rubber stamp. Whatever is testified um, and whatever is testified, whatever the quantities turn out to be from testimony, whether you have physical drugs or not, now that's not, you can't do that. But even as those laws change, I couldn't benefit from them because they weren't retroactive. So I stayed behind bars serving time for laws that had changed and I could not benefit from. So 
It's the system itself. These things must change. And I had to free myself. One of, one of our core things in our faith is forgiveness. We want to be forgiven, but sometimes we find it very hard to forgive others. I had to live my life free in prison by forgiving others, by letting it go. I couldn't do anything about the past. I could make myself miserable. I had to forgive myself. I had to move on. I had to look forward and not look backward and see what does my life look like now. My life was not over. I was still blessed with health and strength, and I knew that there was something else that I could still do. And my my mother told me, Andrew, when I went in, she said, don't forget who you are. She was telling me, don't compromise myself in prison. Hold on to my integrity. Hold on to my character that I didn't have to conform. Sometimes even in society, as I've come home, I've seen how people are so caught up, Andrew, in social media, and they try to conform to an image of what they think other people think they should be. That they, I'm glad that those type of things don't impact my life. And that is what I had to do in prison. It's not conform to the image of what people think I should, I should be as a prisoner, but continue with what I call a spirit of excellence, to rise above where I was, to rise above my situation, my circumstances, what I had been labeled as, I'm labeled it, it, in the drug community. I'm not, that's something I may have done wrong, but that's not who I am as a person. So I couldn't let myself stay stuck in the label that had been put on me. And there's no way that you can tell someone that it's different. You just have to live it that you're different. You just have to live this out. And that gave me lessons to survive when I came home from prison and into a world that was totally different from the one that I left over two decades ago. Yeah, let's talk about that life because, or that transition, because, you know, from 1996 to 2018, a lot of stuff happened outside the prison walls. We have, uh, we have this real estate tycoon that is now the president of the United States. You have someone um, who in 1995, the Kardashian name was known for the attorney for the OJ Simpson trial. You don't really know, you don't know who Kim Kardashian is and right. From the outside looking in, you have so much going on from the outside pop culture wise that literally when you say Kim Kardashian, Donald Trump, and a pardon, you think it's part of a joke, but it really is a huge part of your life that that happened. Let's talk about the viral 2017 online op-ed that led to your uh, commutation uh, June 6, 2018 because of Kim Kardashian West and then President Donald Trump. Being in the Mid-South and my family keeping up with the Kardashians for years, and we saw that episode where Kim told you you were free, uh, we were all just sitting there sobbing because uh, at that time you didn't know that you were going to be free. You're now living free. What are some of the challenges you faced from that roller coaster on June 6th to reintegrating yourself into society? This has been, you call it a roller coaster. I don't know. I used to be afraid of this ride it's called a pivot. Yeah. I would go <laughs> up and down. That's, yeah. I would go up and down, but that's truly how my life has been. But I, my life has been very exciting too, Andrew. It's had its ups and downs and challenges. And as you said, when I went to prison, there was no internet. So I knew nothing whatsoever about uh, the things that are out here today. I didn't know anything about a phone, a smartphone. I came out begging for a flip phone. And then I saw people with these phones. I I want one of those. But after getting it, I wanted a flip phone back because I said, this is a smartphone. And I'm the the dummy because I have no idea how to operate it. When it first rang it, I didn't even know how to answer this phone. And now my phone, I don't know what I'd do if I lost my phone. I'm so attached to it. Uh, But there were many, many changes. Um, Just trying to reintegrate back into society. I faced challenges like getting identification. That's something that must change. 
um, without identification, you can't do anything. You can't get a job. You can't get a bank account. I didn't have any insurance coming out. My first two weeks, I got so sick, I had to go to the hospital. And it took me a while to pay that hospital bill off. And also just having, you know, the stigma of an ex-felon. For me, I was able to shake that off and move on. But there are some who come out like me. They can't get past that. Uh, I didn't have issues with hiring, getting a job immediately because I had such strong family support and I immediately started working when I came out. Uh, but that challenge that many face, reintegrating back into their communities, I never heard a woman say that I don't want a job and I don't want to take care of my family. They come out wanting to work, but convincing companies to give them a second chance because of the label of ex felon uh, it's really hard for them. And, you know, I, I truly believe that our faith communities also play a big role in those who are returning back into society. We are people who believe in grace and redemption, but we have to show that to others. As I said, we want forgiveness, but it's so hard many times for people to forgive those that they may have known one way when they went into prison and when they come out they want to still look at them the same way when they totally rehabilitated, they prepare themselves and who wants to go back to prison? They just want to be given a second chance. So our faith communities also play a role in welcoming the returning citizens back and giving them a chance and not label them. Do if you don't want to be labeled, don't label someone else. You know, Andrew, I know this is off topic, but I was so grieved last year when I saw how all police were being labeled. I grieved for them because of what maybe you have, you're always going to have some bad players. I don't care what, but to label everyone collectively, I felt for them because if they, they're there to serve and protect, and then they're being labeled as something else. So I really felt for our, law enforcement that were having labels put on them because I understood what it felt like to have a label put on me. I think that's really powerful too because when you look at law enforcement and you look at the law itself, I mean, you could you could arguably say that they're the reason why, or a huge reason why you spent, be, spent 22 years, 20 almost 22 years, behind bars, but when you look at the redemption, you look at, you know what it was like to be termed as an ex-felon or be labeled as someone that was in prison, you understand sort of the scrutiny that that they may be under and with your faith as well and, and knowing to provide grace and understanding for others, you're able to say, I know that, I know that the stereotype and the label that are put on uh, this group is not, they're not all bad apples. Like you said, they're not no. all bad. Um, and now no. you're advocating for criminal justice reform in the United States and rightfully so um, with your experience, but also just the dedication and God's purpose and work in your life with taking action for good foundation. Talk about your work to reform laws and bring those deserving citizens home. I'm working really hard on a campaign to help those to obtain home under the CARES Act. Many, it's over 4,000 people right now who are in jeopardy of returning back to prison, who have got jobs, who've reintegrated back with their families. And I'm hoping to really make a difference in their lives. But taking action for good, my sole purpose with that is to humanize the incarcerated, to humanize those who have been incarcerated by telling their story when one person goes to prison, their entire family go with them. They're impacted too. So I also show the impact that it's having on families, that it's having on communities. Um, and really, when you read about someone, it does not have the same impact as seeing them, hearing them talk, seeing how it's impacted their families. That is what changed the heart of America. I've been called the face of criminal justice reform because they saw my hurt, my story. They saw my family. All of a sudden, it's not just you reading about this mother, grandmother, great-grandmother who 
who's received this very hard sentence. But you're seeing and hearing my story, you're seeing the impact and the effect that it's had on my family. And so that's what my organization does. And we also drive policy changes because when you tell their stories, you see the broken pieces of our criminal justice system that led to them, of the brokenness of a system that has impacted them to the point that they can't even really reintegrate back into society. So I learned from my own story that it is the storytelling piece that was missing. And that's what I focused myself on. Last year, I did four stories um, that I put, that I advocated for a lot of people. I submitted over 100 clemency petitions. And of those 100 clemency petitions, 46 people through clemency, pardons, compassionate release, received a second chance in life. And the four stories that I that I that I produced and really put all through social media that I sent everywhere, all four of those people are free today. So that is the power of storytelling. That's got to be so fulfilling. And knowing um, one of my my life motto is we will be known by the problems we solve. And when I look at the the life work of Alice Marie Johnson, I look at at your story and how you were giving a second chance and you are paying it forward and you've already given so many other people a second chance through your work. What puts a smile on your face when you look at the impact that you've been able to make over your life? Every day I have a smile on my face because of that impact. Yesterday, one of the people who I have gained is Freedom Duke Tanner. He called me, he calls me mom. He said, you're like my mother. He was speaking at an event for young people. He was a boxer that had a 19 and 0 record that went in at, at, I think it was like 22, and he spent close to 17 years in prison. Well, he's now paying it forward. He was speaking to troubled youth, and he just identified a young man in the audience that he's mentoring. That when I see others paying it forward too, they call me so proud of what they're able to do in their community. When I see, hear from the families, I had mothers calling. One, one of the men who I helped who was serving a life sentence for marijuana, his grandmother refused to have Christmas. She wouldn't cook Christmas dinner. She wouldn't celebrate. She had vowed until her grandson came home. Well, I helped him come home last October and he sent me pictures at Christmas time and it was his anniversary of his one year release last week, I mean, a couple of weeks ago. And he showed me pictures of his family. It, this has had a domino effect of people who are reaching out to help others. Many of them didn't even know that I was advocating for them because I, I, I wasn't really making it public. I saw their cases and I just started working on them. Each one of them grabbed my heart and to know that I have helped people receive their second chance that I have received gives me joy literally every day, even on my worst days, on my bad days. I remember and I think of those who are now free. That is beautiful. I think, I mean, when you look at your life work and overcoming adversity and using your platform to help so many others, there's just, there's nothing better than that. Alice, where can people go to learn more about you taking action for good and purchase your book and support your efforts? They can go to takingactionforgood.org and they can learn more about the work that I'm doing. They can also follow me on Twitter. They used to say free Alice Marie. My Twitter is Alice Marie free because I am free now, Andrew. Uh, That is my Instagram, Twitter. Also, they can find me on Facebook, Alice Marie Johnson. Uh, They can also uh, uh, follow my organization on social media at Taking Action for Good. So we are doing the work, and I really invite others to join us in this work. What can you do more than impacting someone's life? Because the impact that my life has had by Kim putting her brand aside, by the president looking beyond the label that had been put on me and granting me a clemency and later a full pardon, it's had a domino effect 
on my life, my family's life, the generations to come. You don't just save a life, you save a generation. Amen. I, I, Ellis, it's an honor to interview you today. Thank you for coming on the show. Thank you, Angela.